Good morning and welcome to Bible Hour on this beautiful Thursday here in Ocean Grove. And you know, I forgot this morning that this has been 152 years now of God faithfully proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in this little square mile. So I'm just so grateful for that. Amen. Thank you, Mary. And I'm also just reminded of what a privileged place it is for us to be in his presence and for us to be under his teaching. So let's never take that for granted this morning. Amen? So welcome. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let us pray. Well, Father God, we do rejoice this morning, for this is the day that you have made. And we rejoice and we are glad in it because of who you are and because of whose we are. We are your children, your people, the sheep of your pasture. We thank you that you are sovereign over everything that concerns us this morning. And that yesterday, today, and tomorrow are all in your hands. So I just commit this hour to you, Lord, this square mile to you, Lord. I pray for your spirit to fill us this morning, that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts and give us a spirit of wisdom to know you better. We need you, Lord, and we are so grateful that we can boldly come before your throne of grace to find the mercy and grace we need each and every morning, for your mercies are new every single morning. And great is your faithfulness. So I lift up Reverend Jim to you this morning, Lord, and I just ask that you would speak through him today, that the meditations of his heart and the words of his lips would be pleasing to you, but that we would not just be hearers of the word, Lord, because you tell us if we are just hearers of the word and not doers, we deceive ourselves. So, Lord, please remove any distractions this morning as we exhale any problems that we may have, any fears, hurts, pains, sorrow, and we inhale your power, your strength, your wisdom, your love, your forgiveness. And may it be a day that we are transformed more and more into the image of your Son. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I just preached myself happy. All right. So if you would be so kind as to stand, if you are able, we are going to sing two songs this morning. Number 104, Tis So Sweet, and then number 101, Fill My Cup. 104, Tis So Sweet.
Amen. Please turn to 101, a few pages back. Fill my cup, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Well, thank you, Faith. That was beautiful. Uh, we have a few announcements this morning. Um, if you have not received your Ocean Grove Summer Guide, you're going to want to pick one of these up. I believe they're right on the back table. It has all the um, activities and programs listed for each day, times, and places. Please avail yourself to one. They're on the back table. And, of course, you can always check out the Ocean Grove website. On the weekend, of course, we have our Sunday morning worship, 9 a.m. Beach Church at the Boardwalk Pavilion. And then at 10.30, Pastor Christian Andrews will be teaching in the Great Auditorium, and he will be our Bible teacher for next week. So um, you want to come out for that. Of course, we want you to visit our hub. This is a bookstore to your left and my right. It's more than just a Christian bookstore, though. It's a wonderful ministry. You can go there for prayer. Linda will be more than happy to, happy to help you find th things you need for your home. They're all E for edifying. So you're going to want to check out the hub Friday starting tomorrow, Bridge Fest, two-day radio rally here in Ocean Grove, Friday and Saturday. So come out and check, check that out. And on Friday, our very own Jim Midling will be signing his book after Bible Hour at the Hub. So if you haven't had a chance to um, pick up his book, you'll want to do that. And then he will graciously sign it for you on Friday. All right. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward now as we take the offering this morning. As Pastor Jim reminded us yesterday, we're returning a portion to the Lord this morning, and we are, it's a form of worship for us, so let us pray. Lord, we do know that you are the giver of every good and perfect thing, and we thank you this morning as we are given the opportunity to return back to you a portion. We pray, Father God, that it will be used to further your kingdom and that you will be glorified through it.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we're going to sing number 231. There's just something about that name. You see, there's a theme this morning. His name is Jesus. And we're just keep singing about him all morning. So there's just something about that name. 231. Thank you. All right. Well, it's my privilege and pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Jim Mindling back up here today. His first book, Learn to Breathe, The Surprising Path to a Transformed Life, teaches people how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, who is working to make us more and more like Christ. Please help me give a warm Ocean Grove welcome to Reverend Jim Mindling. How's this? All right. It feels like I'm on. Good. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Sandy. And um, it's good to be with you guys again this morning. Man, the weather here this, this week has been fantastic. We are perfect. Um, how many of you heard, uh, Carrie was just telling me this morning, how many of you heard about the, uh, the condo in Miami, is it Miami Beach? That uh, 12 story just collapsed and so uh, I don't know whether that happened last night or this morning but um, let's be praying for the people who were in it or around it that's uh, that's scary just 12 stories <laughs> um, in other news <laughs> that sounds like a news reporter doesn't it <laughs> um, maybe some of you remember hearing the story of uh, pastor uh, James Warren Jones who um, um, had a great um, start to his ministry, um, was in California, was named a, a, one of the most influential young preachers in California, um, was uh, named Humanitarian of the Year Award for all of his ministry and work with people, and um, he was especially helpful with people who were going through difficult times. So the mayor put him on the San Francisco Housing Authority, and he, he just was serving everywhere. People were starting to come to his church. Uh, by, the, by, by the droves, uh, the president of the United States put him on uh, one of his councils, and he, he was just rising in popularity. And he, the theme of his church was, we, we obey the Bible just as it is written. Amen. We, obey, we obey the Bible just as it is written. And I would say amen. That's, that's, a, that's, that's awesome. But um, somewhere along the line, Pastor James Warren Jones got a little squirrely and started teaching some things that were a little strange and asking people to do some things that were a little strange. And so he got, started getting some pressure. And so he gathered all of the people who were his closest followers and he moved down to Guyana, South America. Starting to sound familiar? And... Pastor Jim Jones, his nickname from James Warren Jones, began to become a full-fledged cult. And, but his town, Jonestown, and his church all passed away one morning where he convinced everyone in his church to drink poisonous Kool-Aid and commit suicide. And Jim Jones is now remembered as a horrible leader, a cult leader, who's responsible for uh, almost a thousand people dying. What went wrong? I mean, 
I got a few amens from the phrase, we obey the Bible just as it is written. I mean, there's lots of pastors and churches that it's like they hardly even open the Bible. And here's a preacher that opens the Bible and preaches from the Bible and says, we're going to obey the Bible here just as it is written. And that phrase sounds amen worthy. Uh, I couldn't agree more. So what's the problem? Well, it depends on how you interpret the Bible, right? I had a guy ask me, a young Christian asked me one time, I, so I don't understand the church. If the Holy Spirit is the one that leads us all into truth, which we, a verse we read a couple days ago, how can the church be so divided? Got an answer for that? Anybody want to stand up and tell us, how, you know, how, how does that happen? If the Holy Spirit is the one that makes us alive, if the Holy Spirit is renewing us, if we're being renewed in spirit, according to Ephesians 4.23, and all of, everybody's reading the same Bible, same Holy Spirit, how is it that there's so much confusion about biblical teaching and so much disunity and and especially the disunity that is around the Word of God. Because surely there's disunity about how we should practice things. You know, I think we should dunk somebody when we, when we baptize them. I think we should sprinkle, okay? The Bible doesn't tell us which, which way to do it. You know, people get upset when I hold people under the water when I baptize people. I hold them under the water until the bubbles stop. <laughs> and people get upset about that. I'm just trying to get rid of all the sin. Anybody want to get baptized this afternoon? <laughs> no, no, if it's, if it's a method, if it's practices, then you know, we, we, we have different opinions. But if it's the Word of God, how do two Holy Spirit-filled Christians read the Bible differently? I think that's a really important question. And um, you, you could just say, well, because we're all sinners. That, that would be a good start, a really good start. We're all sinners. We're all fallen. Well, Jesus said in John 16, I will send the Holy Spirit who will be your helper, John 16, 13, and he will guide you into all truth. We need the Holy Spirit's help in guiding us into all truth. But we need more than that because as I've asked the question already multiple times, if it's the same Holy Spirit working in all of us, then why don't we all have the exact same interpretation? Oh, yeah, yes. Um, it requires the whole body of Christ to be stepping into complete humility and relying on God's understanding rather than our own. Oh, I love that answer. It requires the whole body of Christ to be submissive in humility. Uh, say that again. And yeah. In humility, seeking God's understanding and rather of our, instead of our own understanding. That, what's your name? Lauren. Lauren, thank you. That is a fantastic answer. And so true. So, um, what happens when you get people doing that who are submissive, who are humble, who are gathered together as the body of Christ, and they want to interpret the Bible the same, but they see it differently? Um, there is an art and a science to interpreting the Bible, and I want to teach you how to do that this morning. Um, uh, all my life as a pastor, I have heard people ask me, you know, how do you go about in interpreting the Bible? How do you do that? I want to learn that. So, really, the very first pastorate that I, that I had was in Philadelphia, Norristown. Anybody know where Norristown is outside of Philadelphia? Not far from here. Um, I developed a class and began to teach people how to study the Bible, how to read the Bible, how to interpret the Bible. And over the years, I've done this for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And uh, it's been thrilling to me to see it's, it's not just people who have seminary degrees who can understand the Bible. Anybody who wants to, anybody who will use the tools that I want to give you today, and I didn't invent these tools. These are tools that the church has come up with uh, throughout uh, Christendom. But uh, sometimes they don't get shared amongst us regular folk. And I consider myself a regular folk because 
I wasn't born a pastor. When I was born, the, the nurses and the doctors didn't gather around and say, oh, what a cute little pastor. You know, I was born just like everybody else, and I was raised in a, you know, a Christian home. Uh, but the Lord taught me over the years, and yes, I became a pastor, and I went to school, and I got educated, or as we say in our house, edumacated. But um, turn to uh, this passage we've been looking at from 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to start a process of teaching you how to interpret the Bible. And if there was ever a, a, a morning to take notes, today would be a good one, because I'm going to give you a tool, and it's, it's going to be a memorable tool, and I hope to, that you can memorize the, the main points of it, but there's some sub-points that I, I, I would love for you to write these down uh, so that every time you read the Bible, you can use this tool. And the tool that I'm going to give you is something that the more you use it, the easier it becomes to remember and it becomes like clockwork. And you get to the point where every time you open the Bible, every time you're in church and someone opens the Bible, every time you're in a Bible study and someone opens the Bible, every time you're in Bible hour and somebody opens the Bible, you're going to be so used to doing these steps that you're, it's just going to be in sync. And you're going to be finding yourself, a, from now on, reading the Bible, interpreting the Bible this way. And this is, the, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so 2 Timothy chapter 3 teaches us this core doctrine that all Scripture, I'm in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'm looking at a bunch of servants of God. Uh, I'm, I know I'm, people who are listening to me are servants of God. They, you want to understand the Bible. You want to be equipped. And all Scripture has been given to us, and as we learned a couple days ago, breathed out by the Holy Spirit, and the, the word we use for that is inspiration, and then there's a second word that's important, and that's illumination. So inspiration, the Holy Spirit inspires the Bible to be written. And then the Holy Spirit continues to work in our lives to illuminate, which means to give light, to open up understanding, to, um, to shine the light of God's truth upon the Word. So he, the Holy Spirit inspires the Word, He illuminates the Word, and then there's another I, it's the Holy Spirit then it helps us interpret the word. Interpret. So these three words, inspires, illuminates, interprets. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in helping us to renew us in the spirit of our mind as we turn our brains on, engage our minds, and read the Bible, asking the Holy Spirit to help us. So I've, already, I've actually already given you the first step. So the first step of the three steps I'm going to give you today, the first steps of the, how the Holy Spirit helps us interpret the Bible is the word ask. So write down the word ask. Um, and what, what I mean by this is two big steps. Uh, the first step of asking is the first thing I do is ask the Holy Spirit, help me to understand what I'm reading. Because I believe, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, that you inspired the word, that you will illuminate it to help me understand it, and I believe you will help me interpret it. So I'm asking you. You remember that passage in James 1 we looked at a couple days, or was it yesterday? Just a couple of verses later, James 1, 5, uh, James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. Well, well, when I read the Bible, I need wisdom. Anybody else that way? Yes, you, you are, whether you know it or not. <laughs> Uh, so I need wisdom. So I, I ask. Can I, can I just kind of step on some toes this morning? How arrogant is it for us to open the Bible and ignore the author of the Bible who inspired it to be written, to ignore him and just start reading it as if it's a novel? 
Now, I think the Bible is full of fantastic, fantastic stories. There's a lot of parts that are very novella, you know, and it's, it's wonderful reading, but you, this is the, the holy word of God. And while we don't worship it, we don't worship the Bible, we do hold it in reverence. And we should never treat the Bible in a trivial way. And I think when we go to the Bible and try to read it, like looking for some magic words or looking for some spiritual nugget, and I know I'm stepping on some toes here because that's how a lot of us read the Bible, I think we're misusing the Bible. I think we're dishonoring the Bible. The Bible's not meant to be a little spiritual nugget that it helps you. It's the revealed Word of God, and we need to approach it reverently, and we need to approach it with humility, and instead of trying to um, uh, treat the Word like some magic words, we treat it as the holy words of God that we want to understand. And we ask the Holy Spirit's help, because as we saw uh, I'm tying all these scriptures we've, t we've talked about this week. As we saw from Romans 8, we need the Holy Spirit to help us understand. Our minds are darkened. Our minds are um, um, darkened by sin. And the Holy Spirit illuminates. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes. So let's ask him. So I do this. Oh, by the way, the method I'm going to teach you is the method I use every sermon I write. Every teaching I do at our church, every conference I preach at, every morning when I have devotions with my wife, every time I open the Bible, I use this method. So whether I'm writing a sermon or whether I'm just having my devotions for the day, I use this. So I want to make sure you, you realize there's not a, a luxury version. There's not a deluxe version. This is what I do. And uh, so I ask the Holy Spirit to open my eyes and then I ask what are historically called the six journalistic questions. Who, what, when, where, how, why. And listen, I bombard the text with questions. I, I'm just constantly asking. I'm a very inquisitive person, um, but it's not because I'm an inquisitive person. It's because questions are the shovels that Oak that dig in the dirt that, that, uh, that, ex that expose the treasure chest of God's truth that's right there to be seen. Questions are the things that open up what the Bible says. So, uh, I ask the Holy Spirit to open my eyes and then I ask Him, I I'm, literally, I'm literally in dialogue with the Holy Spirit as I'm reading the Bible. So, like if I'm looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, I'll, I'll ask the question, all Scripture is God-breathed. Hmm. What does it mean to be God-breathed? Ask, I'm asking, what? And so, um, what does it mean to be God-breathed? Oh, I'm asking who? Who breathes out the Scripture? Who authored the Scripture? God, not Paul, not some other person. It's, it's authored, it's breathed out by God. And so, you know, the, um, things that are obvious come out by me asking who, what, where, when, and how. Hi. Why? Hi. Um, but some things that aren't obvious. And here's what I've discovered. The more I ask questions, the more, the digger I find, the, the deeper I dig, the more I see. Because questions open up other things that I didn't see with my first question, and it's just kind of like walking through doors. You walk through a door into a room, oh, there's more doors. And so I walk into that, into that door, to the next room, to the next room. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm deep in this house, deep in this place, because I keep walking through doors. That's what questions are like. They're like doors that we walk into, the treasure chest, the treasure room of the Word of God. So don't just ask a couple questions, then move on to step two. Ask, ask, ask. Who is writing this? Who is speaking? So let me ask you, who is speaking in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16? Who's speaking? Paul. God is speaking, but, and, but, and also Paul is speaking. Who is Paul speaking to? Exactly. So we, see, we answer these questions. Now, you know, I just gave it away because it's written in 2 Timothy, and I told you Paul was writing to Timothy. But when you're reading Proverbs, chapter 2, and, and the Proverbs says, Listen, my son, and I will give you words of wisdom. 
from, from what you know about Proverbs, who is speaking? Solomon is speaking. And who is he speaking to? His son. So it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? It's the king speaking to his son. This is a great parenting passage. This is a great passage for me as a father or as a mother to open up to my, very, my children and say, hey, let's read the Bible together. Here's a, here's a father-son passage. Here's a, a parent-child passage. This is a great passage to look to as a parent. And um, you know, when I'm reading John 15, uh, I'm asking myself, okay, who's speaking? And Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So Jesus is speaking. Who is he speaking to? Who, who knows? His disciples. And so I'm thinking, okay, as I'm reading along, I'm, I'm thinking, what is Jesus saying specifically to the disciples that he, he wouldn't be saying to a larger crowd? And um, I, I just keep asking who. I keep asking what. I keep asking why. Why may be my favorite question. Why did Paul write this to Timothy? Well, because Timothy needed to be equipped in the Word of God. He needed to be reminded that, the whole, that, the, um, that his mother and his grandmother had taught him the word. And he needed to be reminded that no matter how smart he was getting, no matter how much he was growing, he needed to keep coming back to the word of God. Keep coming back to the word of God. Keep coming back to the word of God. So Paul is reminding this, and we discover this as we ask the who, what, where, why, how, when questions. Uh, you cannot ask. You cannot ask. I think it's when I move, so I won't move. <laughs> you cannot ask too many questions. Nope. You cannot ask too many questions. And the better you get at asking questions, the more you will learn. So sometimes we learn things like I'm about to teach you, and we try to rush through them. Don't rush this process. Just keep asking. And Another question you can ask is, Holy Spirit, what should I be asking? Um, <clears throat> I was uh, pastoring in a church that I planted in Gardner, Kansas one, uh, at one point, and uh, one day I, another pastor visited our church on a Sunday morning, and um, he came up to me afterwards and he said, wow, man, I, I'm on vacation, I wanted to, just, I wanted to hear you preach, and I, I was blown away at the things that you said. Where did you, where did you get that sermon? And I said, uh, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, who, 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 who did you get that sermon from? I was, I was confused. And I said, well, God? I, 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 uh, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, I mean, did you get that sermon from some other preacher? And th I was a young preacher at this point. I was like, no, I, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, I, I get all my sermons from Rick Warren, or from, you know, other pastors, and, you know, that's a great sermon you preach. Where did you get it? I said, well, I, I got it from the Bible. <laughs> and again, I'm so confused. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not talking to a person who doesn't know the Bible. I'm talking to a pastor. And he said, well, where did you learn how to study the Bible like that? I, I, I was like, well, in, I, in seminary, I've been growing up in church. I, mean, I said, well, where did you, I mean, you're a pastor. Where, where did you learn to study the Bible? He goes, well, I don't, I don't know, but not like that. And so another pastor asks me, can you teach me how to study the Bible so I can write sermons, biblical sermons, like you did? I was flabbergasted. And that started a process of me just kind of, when I got around other, other pastors, I started asking, you know, do you write your own sermons or do you preach other people's sermons? And to my shock, I discovered a lot of pastors who were just borrowing sermons from other preachers, especially famous ones, changing a word here or there, and then just recycling their, their preaching. I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm such a new pastor, I didn't even know you could do this. I'm like, isn't that plagiarism? <laughs> Don't kids get kicked out of school for doing stuff like that? Isn't that wrong? But you're a pastor. And check this out. So I, um, I was talking to another pastor about this, and he said, um, he goes, well, surely, Jim, you don't understand. You're planting a church. It takes so much time to plant a church. You don't have time to, do the, the, to, to write your own sermons, so you, you, you know, you've got so much work to do as a church planter, so you just download somebody else's. 
And I said, that, that's something's wrong to me. He goes, well, Jim, because at that time I was leading worship and, and I was writing my own, writing some songs. He said, you led worship for all these pastors at this conference today. Uh, did you only sing your own songs? And I said, well, no. He goes, well, if you, if, you, if you can sing a song somebody else wrote, why can't you preach a sermon somebody else preached? And I said, that's a good question, but I, kn I know the answer is, is, is not what you want. It, it just, it seems to me to be wrong. I believe that the man of God, that the preacher, is supposed to hear from God and get a fresh word for that group. And so I think we should listen to God. I think we should, you know, write our own sermons. And I just never have gotten over that. So I actually went and got my doctorate eventually, and my, my whole topic was how to listen to the Holy Spirit as a preacher writing sermons. Um, how the Holy Spirit helps people to interpret the Bible, pre preachers to interpret the Bible and then write sermons to the glory of God. And uh, I've had a blast doing that. And um, I did this survey of over 2,000 pastors, and I was shocked by how many pastors said, I'm not writing my own sermons, I'm preaching somebody else's. So, you know, if that's happening in the pulpits, you know, what's happening everywhere else? So, you know, guys, we, we can learn how to do this, and it starts with just asking questions. And the more questions you ask, the better you get at it. So, step one, ask. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom, and then ask questions of the text. Okay, the next step. I guess you can imagine it starts with A because I'm, I'm a, a guy who likes alliteration. The next step is analyze, analyze, and what you're doing is you're analyzing the answers to the questions you asked in point and the first step. So I ask the question, who wrote 2 Timothy? And then I think about it. I analyze. Analyzing is just thinking. And as I'm thinking about this, this question, and uh, I start asking more questions because I'm using the, the question method throughout my process, but now I've moved beyond just asking questions, and now I'm thinking hard. Um, write down the word ponder underneath analyze. I'm pondering, and I'm, I'm thinking hard. I'm, I'm being renewed in the spirit of my mind, and either tomorrow or Saturday, I'm going to preach a sermon about uh, how the Holy Spirit renews our mind. I'm still working on that. Um, but uh, um, the, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's using our mind, and so we have the ability to think. So we're pondering. We're, we're picturing. Uh, so like when I'm reading John 15, and Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, I picture in my mind a vineyard. And I picture Jesus standing in the vineyard and um, this has gotten easier for me ever since I went to Israel. <laughs> and uh, now I, when I take people to Israel, I take them to a vineyard. And we literally walk through the, the rows of the vineyard. And we, and we kind of drag our hands along the, the branches. And we, and we stop and we, we talk about what does it mean to be the vine? What does it mean to be the branches? And so, it, you know, you've been to a vineyard probably or can see one on, uh, see a picture. Picture in your mind a branch in the vine. So it's not just some abstract thought. And think when Jesus says, if you abide in me, if you stay connected to me, you will bear much fruit. See the fruit in your mind. Picture in your mind the, the scene as best you can as you're, um, writing, as you're reading the scripture. When I get to 2 Timothy, I'm, uh, I, I've, I've asked the question, who's writing this? I've asked the question, where? So I know by the way, do you know the answer to the question, where was Paul when he wrote this? He was in prison. And the more questions I ask, I discover that it was a prison. They were probably the last prison he was in before he died. So I'm picturing an old man now. I'm picturing a man with chains. I'm picturing a man who's either writing or dictating to someone else. I'm, I'm picturing the urgency of an old man passing on to his young disciple, Timothy, important truths. And as I picture this in my mind, you know, I, I'm, in the, I'm, in the, I'm in the prison cell, or I'm, I'm Timothy, and I'm reading this, this parchment from the man that I love that's in jail, and I realize how important these words are. So as I'm picturing this, I'm, I place myself in the passage. You see what I'm saying? And guys, when we place ourselves in there, it becomes alive. 
all of a sudden the Word of God just begins to just come to life and I, I see things and I imagine things and I, I, I understand things that, that make more sense, that help me realize some of the tension in the passage, help me realize some of the gravity of the moment, things I don't discover in a commentary, things I discover as I ask who wrote this, why did he write it, where was he when he wrote it, where was Timothy when he read it. Uh, you know, all these who, what, where, why, how questions. And so I'm thinking, I'm analyzing, I'm, I'm thinking about these things in my second step. So in step one, ask, I'm asking, what does it say? In step two, analyze, I'm asking, what does it mean? See the difference? And in step one, ask, I'm just, try, I'm just gathering data. I'm just asking, what does it say? What does the text actually say? And then in step two, the analyze, I'm asking, what does this mean? You know, how do I, how do I understand this? And so I keep, I'm, I'm in dialogue with the Holy Spirit, and this is what I wrote about in my doctoral thesis, that when I write a sermon, when I study the Bible, I am in dialogue. I'm, I'm literally talking to the Holy Spirit throughout the process. So if you're with me, you might think that's kind of strange. Who are you talking to? The Holy Spirit, where is he? Well, you know, He's, a, he's around, I don't know, you know, but he's here, he's present, and he authored the text, so I literally enter into a dialogue with the Holy Spirit as I'm studying the Bible, as I'm writing my sermons, and so, sometimes I, I'm on my knees, sometimes I'm um, sitting at a desk, sometimes I'm sitting in a chair, sometimes I'm standing, but I'm in dialogue, I'm in a conversation with the Holy Spirit. Why did you inspire Paul to write that, Holy Spirit? Why here? Why now? Um, why this word? Um, you know, you could have used a different word. You could have said it a different way. Why did you say it this way? And, you know, some people might think that that's irreverent to, to ask questions. So why did you do it this way? I don't think so. I think the Bible invites us to open, to read, to understand. The Bible invites us to enter in. The Bible invites us into a relationship with God. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm not treating the, book, the Bible like a science book. I've already told you I'm not treating it like a novel. I'm also not treating it like a science book. I'm treating it like a love letter. And so I'm, I'm savoring it. I'm meditating on it. I'm thinking about it. And I'm rolling it over in my mind again and again. So I'm, I'm pondering. I'm picturing. Here's a third step underneath analyze. I'm, I might paraphrase it. Uh, in other words, put it in my own words. And by, by studying the Bible, asking who, what, where, why, when, and how questions, by analyzing it and thinking, as you are in this dialogue with the Holy Spirit in the text, you start really grasping what it means. And so I, I will write down in my own words, this is what I think this verse means, and try, try to come up with a different way of saying it. And by, by pushing myself to write it in my own words, I'm deeply getting engaged in the, in the Bible. See, everything I've said so far, you don't need to know Greek. You don't need to know Hebrew. You don't need to know um, the science of interpretation. I'm actually giving it to you. All the things they teach you in seminary, which are so important, everything I've taught you right now is you can do, right? I haven't asked you to do anything that you're like, well, I'm not smart enough, or I didn't go to college. Can you ask questions? then you can do this. Can you think about and analyze the answers to the questions that you wrote down? Yes, you can. You do this. We think and analyze all the time. So you're just taking something that you already do and you're applying it to the Word of God in a very deliberate, intentional way. And as you start writing down these questions and writing down the answers and writing down your thoughts, all of a sudden insights start coming. And you're like, where did that come from? The, the process of you being engaged with the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you guys, this stuff just comes. As you do these things, as you ask these questions, as you analyze um, the, the answers to the questions, ideas come up, thoughts come up, insights come up, because you're engaged with the text. You're engaged with the Holy Spirit who authored this and who wants to give you revelation. He wants to reveal to you what this means. You just need to take seriously and to take the time to pause 
and to ask the questions and to think about the answers. So you're picturing it, you're, you're paraphrasing it, you're pondering it. You know, these are all things that you're doing. You're, you're, you're praying the text. Um, so Lord, since all scripture is God breathed, would you breathe the scripture into me right now? And since it's all useful, would you help me to understand? I'm turning this verse into a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for breathing out your word. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring your word. Thank you that it's useful for teaching. Thank you that it's useful for rebuking, for correcting, for understanding. Lord, thank you for that. And, and help me to understand what you're saying. So I'm praying the text. Um, years ago, when I first came to the church that I'm pastoring now, I've been there 18 years, I devised a daily devotional method where I invited everybody in our church to, uh, to do you know, four things. Uh, read this passage of Scripture. So th through the course of the year, we read through the whole New Testament and we read through the Psalms. Um, and so as you're reading daily, there's a little section to read. And then... Uh, I um, have somebody on our staff or me or you know, somebody takes a turn each week to pick a verse from that reading to have people meditate on. So for instance, if you were, if you were supposed to read 2 Timothy chapter 3 today, then I might choose 2 Timothy 3.16 and say, now meditate on that verse for today. Tomorrow, it'll be a different reading. We'll do 2 Timothy chapter 4. And then we'll, someone will pick a verse from there to meditate on. And then... Um, then there's a memory verse for the week, a meditation verse for the day, but a memory verse for the week. And then there's a prayer that, again, I or a staff member writes out based upon the meditation verse. So every day you're reading the Bible, you're meditating on a verse of the Bible, you're memorizing and reviewing a verse for the week, and you're praying that verse. And that simple process every day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, that will shape a group of people. That will shape you by the Word of God. Reading it, meditating it, memorizing and, and praying it. That simple process. You, you're, you're not going to read the Bible in one sitting. Nobody is going to read the Bible in one sitting. And even if you did, you're, you're not going to grasp everything that there's there. So, you know, you, you do this a day at a time, a little at a time. And I'm, I promise you, if you'll practice the ask and the analyze, you will be a long way towards understanding the Bible and it beginning to shape your life. But now, um, once, you've, uh, once you've begun to analyze the text, the text, now you want to let the text analyze you. I, I got that from Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, where David writes, um, Search me. Oh God, and, and see my inmost thoughts and see if there's any wicked way within me. That's a, that's a verse I've, apparently I have memorized. Um, and that verse that David wrote is a verse to invite the Holy Spirit to search us. So I, this is not just an intellectual exercise where I'm just gathering data, data. There's a myth in the church today that information equals transformation. And let me explode that myth. You can know all kinds of information about the Bible. You can do step one, ask, and, and have millions of questions that you've asked, and you, and you know the answer to all of them. You're a Bible scholar, and you know all these answers. But you've never allowed the Bible to analyze you. You've never allowed the Bible to search your heart, and you keep the Bible at a distance. I discovered this as a young seminary student when I came across a book written by a scholar of the New Testament and I was reading it and my professor said, oh, be careful with that book. That guy's not a Christian. I said, well, he's a New Testament scholar. How can he not be a Christian? And my professor looked at me like, really? You're that stupid? Are you a first year student? <laughs> yes. <laughs> There are people who know the Bible inside out but who have never surrendered their life to Christ. I hope you've never met anyone like that. But you can know the Bible. 
and not know the author of the Bible. You remember when Jesus was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness? Do you remember that Satan quoted the Bible? Apparently, Satan knows the Bible. So you can know the Bible, but not be transformed by it. So take this second step of analyze, ask, analyze, and then you're analyzing the text and then you're letting it analyze you. You're letting it search, it search you. Take this seriously. Don't rush to the third step, even though you, you've already started, and I'll explain it in a second. Pause and ask the Holy Spirit, search my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me. Don't let me be a person who's merely gathering information about the Bible. Transform me by the power of your word. Amen? Amen. So, so, okay, we've gone step A, or step one, ask. Step two, analyze. Now we're at the final step. The third step is apply. James 1.22 uh, did Sandy, did you quote this verse? Yeah, I think you, did. you quoted James 1.22 today, didn't you? Let us not just be hearers of the word only, but doers. That's apply. When Jesus finished the greatest sermon on the history of the earth, the Sermon on the Mount, the last point of his Sermon on the Mount, he said, now there are two kinds of people here today. And he's standing on this mountain, uh, this hillside, speaking to people, thousands of people there. There's two kinds of people all of you are hearing me, but there are those who are hearing but are not going to do it. Remember what he said? You're like the person who builds their house upon the sand, and when the storms come, the winds blow, life gets hard, that house crashes and burns. Wait a minute. They were listening to Jesus himself. Wouldn't that be amazing to actually listen to Jesus himself in the flesh? They sat under the teaching of Jesus Christ himself. But Jesus said, your house is going to fall because you're not going to do, you're just going to hear. But then he said, there's those of you who are hearing and do, you're going to do the word of God. You're going to apply it to your life. Blessed are you. You're like a person who builds a house on the rock. The winds come, same winds that came to the other house. The winds blow, the storms come, trials happen, but that house will stand because it's built on the rock. That's the person who applies. So, how do I apply the Word of God to my life? And years ago, I, I, I would love to give this person credit. I don't know where I heard this from, but it was a long time ago. I heard an acronym S-P-A-C-E, make space for the room, for the Word of God to be present in your life. And this acronym, S-P-A-C-E, is five questions that you ask. And this is how you apply the Word of God. This is how you get a handle, a grip on the Word of God. S, ask, is there a sin? The S of space, is there a sin that the Holy Spirit is pointing out in my life as I read this text? That's a bold question, isn't it? Is there a sin that the Holy Spirit is pointing out? P, this word is space. P, is there a promise in the passage that I'm reading that I should claim? Like 1 John 1, 7. If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. So I want to claim that promise. I don't want to just read 1 John 1, 7 and go, oh, that's cool. No, that's a promise because I'm going to sin. So I want to claim that promise. So S, is there a sin I need to confess? P, is there a promise I need to claim? A, is there an attitude I need to change? Ooh, that's a good question. Because since I've done these steps of ask, analyze, and now I'm in apply, as I've been in the Word, I've, I've asked the questions and thought about them and wrestled with them, is the Holy Spirit want to point out an attitude in me? An attitude of arrogance, an attitude of apathy, an attitude of covetousness, an attitude of irritation, you know, a thousand different attitudes. Is there an attitude that I need to change? So Holy Spirit, I'm asking again, is there a sin here that you're pointing out in my life? Is there a promise I need to claim? Is there an attitude that you want to change in my life? C, S-P-A-C, is there a command I need to obey? 
Oh, there are thousands of commands in the Bible. It's, it's wrong for us to read a command of the Bible and go, oh, I, that's good. How, how about the great Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Um, hear, O Lord, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and thou shalt, the King James, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. That's a command. When Jesus picked it up, he added, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's a command. So that's, that's a command we see in the Bible again and again and again. I need to obey that command. So I'm asking the question, Lord, is there a command here that I need to obey? And the final question, E, example. Is there an example here I need to follow? So, you know, I'm looking at the 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Is there a Timothy I need to write to to encourage? There's an example for me to follow. Is there a Paul that I need to, you know, um, seek out to get counsel from? Um, is, is there a scripture that Paul is referring to that I have not paid attention to? You know, I'm, I'm asking, is there an example here? Now, let me, let me say this before I close. Um, when you're doing the first step, ask you may not be able to answer every, of, every one of the six questions. Who, what, where, why, when, how, what. But keep asking. But don't, be, or don't make this into a legalistic thing. You may say, well, I don't know the answer to this question. Okay. Underanalyze. You, know, you may go, well, I don't, I don't you know, know how to analyze this. Just keep asking the Holy Spirit. When you get to the apply, the third step, there, maybe there's not a command there for you to obey. Maybe there's not a promise to claim. That's okay. Don't make up one, okay? I, you're just asking, is there a sin here I need to confess? Is there a promise I need to claim? Is there an attitude I need to change? Is there a command I need to obey? Is there an example I need to follow? I guarantee you, one of those five questions you're going to be able to answer. And yes, there's a sin, promise, attitude, command, or example that I can follow. Maybe two or three of those questions will apply to you. The, the point isn't to try to get every single application. The point is to get at least one so you're not reading the Bible gathering information and then walking away. But you're applying it to your life. So, everybody, all, you all got the three steps memorized. Let's repeat them together. Ask, analyze, apply. See how easy that is? Let's say it again. Ask, analyze, apply. Every time you read the Bible, you can ask questions, you can analyze it, and then apply it to your life. And write down, you know, put a little, create a little bookmark and write down, ask, analyze, apply. And underneath ask, put the questions. Who, what, where, why. Uh, underneath analyze, ask, put the word ponder, picture, prayer, paraphrase. <coughs> underneath the word apply, put the space acronym. Is there a sin I need to confess? Is there a promise I need to claim? Is there an attitude I need to change? Is there a command I need to obey? Is there an example I need to follow? You can put that on a little bookmark, put it in your Bible, and every time you read the Bible, that bookmark will be there. And it will remind you of the three steps with all their sub-steps. And the day will come when you will have all those memorized, and every time you read the Bible, you'll be doing those three steps. Amen? Amen. So let me just let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, thank you for inspiring the Word of God. And thank you for giving us these tools to open it up and I pray for everyone hearing my voice that as we learn this process and put it into practice day by day by day by day by day that we will be like the person that Paul talked about in 2 Timothy who are people who handle the word of truth correctly. We will not have to be ashamed because we will learn how to rightly divide the word of God and we can do this because you're here to help us. And so as we do this every day, Holy Spirit, renew us in the spirit of our mind as we engage with reading and understanding and applying, with asking, analyzing, and applying the Word of God to our life. If we ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 All right, God bless you.